And today, the Supreme Court ordered that old 200 and 500 and 1,000 Naira notes remain in circulation till the 31st of December 2023. The Apex Court also nullified the federal government's Naira redesign policy, declaring it as an affront to the 1999 Constitution. Justice Emmanuel Ajim, who read the lead judgment, held that a preliminary objections by the defendants, the Attorney General of the Federation, Bayelsa, and other states, are dismissed as the court has the jurisdiction to entertain the suit, citing Section 23, Subsection 2 of the Constitution. The court held that a dispute between the federal government and the state must involve law or fact. The Apex World further held that President Muhammad Buhari in his broadcast admit that the policy is flawed with a lot of challenges. Let me allow you to listen uh, to some of the governors who went to court to challenge the federal government on this matter. We are very grateful to the court for its unanimous decision and the orders it has given to the government, federal government of Nigeria to ensure that from today till the 31st of December 2023, the old Naira notes of all denominations shall continue to circulate side by side with the new Naira notes. That's the major decision of the Supreme Court. The other decision is that the policy of currency confiscation, where you deposit money in the bank and the bank chooses what to give you, is unlawful and illegal and shall end forthwith. So Nigerians can go to the bank and collect whatever they have deposited and get on with their lives. Those that said that we went to the court because of elections are wrong. We went to the court because our people in our states are suffering and businesses in our states are coming to a halt and lives were being destroyed. That's why we went to court. We left elections in the hands of God and we all know the result. Even though this policy was designed to ensure that we did not win the presidential elections, we have won. This particular decision today has proven that Nigerian law is a respecter of no one, including Mr. President. Nobody can take the laws for granted and go scot-free. This is what it has proven today. I congratulate Nigerians. I congratulate the common men. And I sympathize and condole those that have lost their lives in these struggles. It's not about me or about Erufai or about general. It is about the Nigerians. Therefore, we have made it today, and we thank all the judges. Seven of them give same judgment. So we thank all of them, and we thank all of you for being here to see all the proceedings, and we know we have won this battle. All right. Those are some of the governors who were on the, on the side. They were the ones who took the federal government to court. There are other uh, colleague governors also went to support the federal government as a biaser and a do state, saying that, uh, well, the federal government stand is right. I have one of the governors who went to court uh, here with me in the studio, Governor Yaya Bello of Kogi State joins us live here in Abuja studio. Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Shil. <clears throat> and uh, would I say Happy New Year once again? And, <laughs> See you uh, physically for the first time Exactly, this year. <laughs> in the studio. And uh, good evening, viewers in Nigeria and across the world. Thank you so much for joining us. How do, how do you feel? Uh, you challenge your party's position. You challenge your very good friend, President Buhari's di directives and the CBN's uh, policy and the Supreme Court. And you came victorious yourself and your colleagues. How does that make you feel? Thank you very much. Um, it is not a, an issue of a victory or victor and vanquish in this particular case. Yes, definitely. If you look at the three of us, you know, myself, Governor Erufai, and Governor Matawale of Zamfara State, we are among those that are very close to Mr. President. And we are among those that are very loyal to our party, the All Progressives Congress. But at the same time, all of us, all the APC governors, and it will interest you that some PDP governors are passionate about this country, and we have the love of our people at heart. Of course, it's a president, our father, and our leader. It's a man that has the compassion and love of all at heart. 
and hence uh, he's been president today. And you know surely that Mr. President came up with so many programs and policies that touched on the lives of Nigerians. Mr. President is winding down. People like us would want Mr. President to finish very strong. And as such, a policy came up that, um, that is ill-managed, Ill ill-implemented, and ill-timed that is ravaging this country, affecting the common man and everyone in this country, affecting our economy, affecting our, the smooth running of our states. We swore to protect lives and livelihood in our state. And this policy is impeding on that. And hence, we have to, after various you know, attempts to ensure that we think through this particular policy, have failed, have no any option than to recourse to, than to go to court. And today, we've been vindicated. The party have been vindicated. And Mr. President himself is appreciative of the decision of the Supreme Court. And Maybe. have you gotten a feedback from the president? Well, we have been uh, Mr. President's children, and we know that Mr. President himself is relieved today that the people of this country are going to have their life back again. I mustn't necessarily have a feedback from him. So, to the glory of God, Nigerians have their lives back. And uh, let me once again use this opportunity on behalf of myself and my colleagues, uh, including APC governors and few PDP governors, uh, people like uh, Governor Wiki of River State, Governor Ifa of, uh, of uh, no, Governor of uh, Abia State, and the Governor of uh, Sokoto State, Aminu Tambual, and host of all of us, the leaders, appreciate Nigerians, including the media, for standing tall and firm in this particular trying moment of ours. Mm. I use this opportunity to appreciate the Supreme Court who came through for us. This is not just all about Naira redesign. The Supreme Court decision of today has touched so many fabrics of our lives, especially democracy and how democracy should be run in this country. And it has laid a, 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 a solid foundation as to whether we are ripe for restructuring or true fiscal federalism, Supreme Court has really laid the ball. And I think, let us not miss this wonderful opportunity. The, 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 the question is, and I'll get to the meat of what the Supreme Court said and the import of that. Um, uh, the, the big question those your critics were, uh, the reason when you went to court at first was that this was all politics. And the main reason why you did it, or you went to court, was all politics. And they have actually questioned the intention or the genuineness of your going to court. Because they have raised the fact that you have not gone to court on some other policies that have affected the lives and livelihoods of, of average Nigerians. But perhaps you ran to court on a policy that inches on politics on one hand, and it's because you think it was going to affect you politically, that's why some of your colleagues went to court. How do you react to that? There is unfortunate that uh, some people are thinking that way. There has been several cases and incidences where we governors have to take issues up you know, in court. I will not go into that. Let Nigerians make research into that. That is number one. Number two, yes, some people felt that it's because of this just concluded presidential and national assembly election. Far from that. Politics is being played every day, not necessarily because of that last election. But we know surely that the policy is affecting every average Nigerian. There are those who have lost their lives as a result of this particular policy, either due to riot or, or uprising, or those who went to hospital to just merely buy I mean, a medication and they cannot buy it. And there are those that have died of hunger. There are millions of Nigerians that live daily on what they are able to earn. Local economies have been you know, crippled. Those of us that are securing our various states today, especially those of us that are performing security-wise, 
It is impeding on our performance. And if we now say that we should sit behind and allow this to continue so that we won't be accused of politics, then things will go out of hand. Then why are we in office as governor, as, you know, or as leaders in our various rights today? So if anybody is thinking that way, it's most unfortunate. But I want to tell you that it is far from that. If it is because of politics or because of election, the election has come and gone. We have produced a president-elect today in the person of Ashura Jubala Ahmed Tunubu, waiting to be sworn in on 29th of May this year by the special grace of God. So it has nothing to do with that. How do you convince the viewers tonight, uh, those who think that uh, this was all politics, that you did not have the interest of the average Nigerians at heart? Uh, and, and, and on what occasion have you really gone to court, to the Supreme Court, to challenge the federal government on behalf of Nigerians? I'm sure you are aware of um, a particular uh, case that borders on um, Paris Club refund, um, uh, uh, you call it consult consultancy fee, about 418 you know, um, million dollars or billion dollars. We challenge the federal government on that. And there are a host of others, like I said. We are talking of, you know, see, let me tell you today. Shil, you can't boast of 1,000 Naira in your pocket today. You can't boast of it. And number two, the policy is more or less like policy of funds confiscation. You know, packaged so beautifully. But Mr. President was deceived in the implementation. Who are those deceiving them? I mean, those I mean some of your colleagues have said that. But Nigerians are still, I mean, you are members of your party. How difficult is it to know who, who are these uh, the people that you said are deceiving him? See, every time you talk of our political party, political party, look, in APC, we disagree to agree. That is why we are serving the public. In APC, we think through our policies before it is in, being implemented or brought to the public. And those that are not well thought over, before implementation, that we know is going to affect the people, we will resist it. Part of which is this narrow redesign and every other you know, uh, issues that are contained in it. So those that are advising Mr. President economically misled Mr. President in this particular instance. They didn't get it right. Are they members of your party? Um, of course, some are members of our party, and some are inherited uh, PDP members in the party. They are inherited PDP members in the party. Where have you ever seen APC policy being implemented and you see opposition praising it? This has happened in this particular instance. So is there any intention of these people you said have deceived? Because some of the allegations or some of the things that Governor Erifai said is uh, the fact that these are just meant to make your party lose. Is that true? Governor Erufai has his facts. And we have our facts. And what are the facts? The facts are that there are those who have special interests other than interests of this country. And they felt this is the way to take a pound of flesh. And there are fifth, I mean, you say there are fifth columnists in your party. If you watch series of my comments publicly, I have said, Mr. President, have the best of intentions and good policies for this country. And there are too many to mention. But there are those saboteurs, those that Mr. President have really invested confidence in, trust, and they betrayed Mr. President. And people like us that love Mr. President will not sit idle by and allow his name to be dragged into the mud. We have to take measures to make sure that does not happen. And part of which is this going to court. And today, we've been vindicated. And I want to believe that Mr. President would know those who really would love him. Now, you were in court and you listened to the judgment. Yeah. There were a few indictments right uh, here and there. You said? There were a few indictments here and there that the, the Supreme Court gave in its uh, delivery of the judgment. And part of some of the wrongs that the, the Supreme Court highlighted is the decision and the directive of President Buhari. 
How do you feel as an APC member, an ally of President Buhari, when the court, the Supreme Court said, a president was in breach of the Constitution? Well, the truth be told, we were before the apex court in the land. After the Supreme Court, it is God Almighty. As a person, I shook my head. Because I would never allow Mr. President to be misled into taking decision. Did you have the opportunity to speak to him and convince him otherwise? Well, you know, sometimes when the, the, those who have certain pecuniary interests, you know, are at work, you can be shielded away. And uh, I don't talk, I don't complain. I just do my work. But they shielded you people away. They didn't allow you to prevail on the president. Is that the case? Even those that came up with such policies, we engaged them severally and they refused to bend. They refused to see reasons with us. Did you confront them that you think that this was political? Let me tell you, it was in one of these, um, our meetings that we invited some of them to come and make a presentation about this policy. Upon the presentation of the policies or what they want to implement, we challenge them. And you could see those that have made up their mind, they are completely blind to the truth, to see the reality. Their heart was completely blocked from seeing the reality. And one has no option. I mean, you, and you think this was targeted? And that was at... when we now took that decision, that look, we have to challenge this in court. So it was more or less like out of frustration. Leave the election out of it. You see so many properties being burnt. You walk through the, the streets and you see people queuing, sleeping in, in ATMs, in banks. You see businesses, small businesses crumbling. You see people dying. You visit hospitals, you see people dying. And these are people that we came to serve on the altar of ill advice from just few individuals. So we have no option than to go this way. And it is not just the decision of just the three of us. All the APC governors and at least three PDP governors. So we are unanimous in this particular action. Now, in all of this, what would you say is a major lesson that came out for you, uh, apart from the fact that this, the, the CBN had also said, I mean, the Supreme Court had said, even the, the policy on the, the restriction of the, uh, the limit of, uh, of spending, was uh, was illegal. I mean, was not right. That's one of the position of the CBN. You were there. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, that's the position of the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. Yeah. But as a governor, between the dichotomy between the, I mean, in the dichotomy between the federal government and the state government, what do you think was a major lesson that came out to you from the judgment of the Supreme Court? First of all, no one, no president will ever come and lead this country and take unilateral decision. Not even governor will sit down and think you can take a unilateral decision. We've been able to educate her once again that, look, these are federating units. The lands belong to the states. The people are in the states. Before you can govern successfully, come up with any policy that will touch on the lives of the people or that will either impact positively or, or negatively in the way and manner governors will run their affairs, you must do proper consultation. The Supreme, I mean, the, the, the ground of the Constitution envisage that on how decisions are arrived at. So that is a major lesson that we should learn in this particular decision. Nobody should ever abuse his office. Whether you are elected or you are appointed, you must follow the rule of law. Uh, is that the only thing that came out to you? There are several. If okay. I continue to mention them yeah, here, because today, there are I dictatorial tendencies that were also highlighted. Well, that is why in that judgment, mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to ask you: You wanted to be president of Nigeria, but I don't know if you have uh, killed that idea. Or if that the idea is, still, do you still want to be president of Nigeria? Uh, is that still a potential? Today we have a president elect, and the person of Ashua Jubola Ahmed Tenubu. And as much as I have supported the, pre pre the regime of President Muhammadu Buhari, I am ready to support uh, Ashwaj Bola Metunubu's administration or do you still till want to, he succeed. Do you still want to be president in the nearest the, future? The future belongs to God Almighty, and only Almighty Allah have uh, uh, that decision to make for me 
as we move forward. But for now, I have a task at hand in Kogi State, and I am duty-bound to support my party. I am duty-bound to support President, President-to-be, by the grace of God, Ashojibola uh, Ahmed Tunbu, to succeed. And we must give him advice and guide him to ensure that he succeeds beyond with Mr. President. Despite all the achievements of Mr. President, we want Ashwaju to achieve and succeed even more than him. And that is even the dream of uh, our leader, President Muhammad Buhari. So the question I was going to ask is, um, if there were dictatorial tendencies that were highlighted by the Supreme Court as displayed in the policy and the directive of the president, um, is there an aspect of our laws that you think should be amended in this respect? This issue of dictatorial tendency that you keep repeating, let me tell you, Mr. President is one person that... It is not me. Once it was what was captured, and I'm well, using it to that, ask that questions. Is, that, that, so, you know, rightly so. Mr. President is one person that once he gives you responsibility, he allows you to carry it out. Once he trusts you, he will give it to you 100%. One other lesson that any leader and all of us should learn is that don't trust human beings 100% any longer. When you give an assignment or a responsibility, supervise and ensure that the person carried out that responsibility the best way it should. And uh, Mr. President may have acted innocently based on the advice given to him. Unknown to him, these guys have an ulterior motive. So, I think Mr. President should have learned his lesson from, him, from this. And those of us that are upcoming, we should learn our lesson from this. We understand that the President is apologizing and he said he never meant to inflict pain on Nigerians. He truly thought that this was going to help the economy. Without even seeing that apology, Mr. President is a compassionate father, a compassionate leader, a president that has the interest of the Talakawas at hand. I mean, attacked. And in his speech, he did, you know, the speech, in his speech, he did recognize that this particular policy is touching on the fabrics of the economy and is affecting the people, but that he's looking for ways to ameliorate the sufferings of the people. That is compassionate. He realizes that. So he wouldn't want to be a dictator. Who would want to put the lives of the people you know, at risk or in jeopardy? But there are those that took that decision and insisted. There are several things I can say here. What Mr. President directed them to do, immediately to even avert the whole of this uh, 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 problem we are in today. But they refused to do it. Mr. President will not come and address the press and say, look, I have asked these people to do this and they refuse to do. So that is how Mr. President was, you know, was kept in cocoon, let me put it that way. But thank God, all of these are out today. So um, you look at uh, uh, the election of Bola Tunubu and the opposition coming from the opposition party. They've gone to call, they're rejecting it. Yeah. Um, does he in any way taint that victory? Election of 2023 presidential and national assembly election have come and gone. To the glory of God, we have President-elect Ashura Jubala Ahmed Tunubu. In every contest, there must be a winner and a loser. And of course, you can't stop those that lose from venting their grievances and pointing out flaws. In every system of governance, none is perfect 100%. Or electioneering, none is perfect 100%. But let me tell you that substantially, substantially, INEC follow their guidelines and the rules of the game. Our president-elect today followed all these guidelines and the rules, and today he has emerged the, the president-elect. All I could tell my brothers and leaders, Atiku Abubakar and Peter Obi, and the followers, multitude of the followers, is to please calm down. Let us have Nigeria first. Let us live in peace. 
Let us support Ajua Jubola Ahmed Tinubu to implement the laudable programs and policies that he's coming up with as contained in his roadmap, The Renewed Hope 2023. Once you are not satisfied, I'm happy that they are taking the legal and very lawful means to seek redress, but we should not overheat the polity. Let me touch on a few things uh, in your home state. Uh, this matter, what can you tell us about the allegations against you by EFCC vis-a-vis -vis the forfeiture properties of the properties believed to be linked to you? It's a joke taken too far. What do you mean by that? It's a joke taken too far. I think it's just a media witch hunt. Political witch hunt or media propaganda. Let me put it that way. Against myself and the government of Kogi State. A government that has been rated four years back to back by World Bank and other rating bodies, both locally and internationally, to come top in terms of transparency, accountability, and proper judicious utilization of resources. I don't know where they're coming up. What about the arrests that have been made in that respect? Yes, of course. That's, these are still the political witch hunt, I said. Why do you think they're witch hunting you, if reason, that's true? The reason is best known to them. The reason is best known to them. Well, so the matter has been taken to court. It's in court, and we have competent lawyers that are handling it, and I can assure you that it is a fluke. Shem, I rise up to this level today with my integrity. I will leave office with my integrity high. I will never do anything that would dent it. What I have and what I'm building and what I will ever cherish is my name and integrity. And I will never allow anybody to drag into mud. And that is why we decided to choose the very legal and lawful means of ensuring that we have indicated. An allegation is not yet, you know, um, what do you call it? The allegation is mere allegation. Until proven by competent court of, of, of law, you can never ascribe me to such alleged crime or misdeed. And beside so we have an anti-graft agency that you and I know does not respect the law, does not respect court orders. And that has been confirmed by competent court of law. All right, let me take you to a bit of politics. It was very heated in your, in your state. Your opposition, uh, the opposition in your state feels that you are... Uh, you are after them. In fact, uh, very loudly, uh, the senatorial, uh, PDP senatorial candidate, Natasha Apoti, alleged that you went and dug, um, uh, dug the road so that she won't be able to have access uh, to, our, uh, to our area just for her to campaign and have access. Uh, is that you doing that? And why would that happen? First of all, I am not contesting for Senate. I'm not contesting for Senate. So let her and the contestant or the winner of that particular contest slog it out in the appropriate court of law. So you don't that have is, a hand in it? That is number one. Number two, I am the leader of my political party in Kogi State. And I'm duty bound to ensure that my party wins and win cleanly. And that we have done and we have won cleanly many seats and for our president. Thirdly, I am the chief security officer of the state. And I'm sure you know I have earned a lot of awards, presidential and several non-profit -organi uh, organizations, both home and abroad, on security in Kogi State. I know the architecture and the roots of those that come to foment trouble. Before elections like this, we carry out assessments and see exactly where the enemies are coming from, especially those that, have, that are headbent in killing our people. 
Let me just give you a short uh, 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 reminder, if you don't know. In 2019, my cousin was killed shortly before this election, before the last 2019 general elections in Okene, Yusuf Adabenege. Obuju was killed in that same election. Kamal was killed in that election. Moshud was killed in that election. My PA domestic was attempted. He sustained bullet wounds, and a policeman was killed in that particular election. That is prior to the election, about a week or two to the election. Um, my chief of staff was, was attempted. It was out of bravery that he was able to apprehend one before the general public came to his rescue. They, these were attempts. And we trace their roots. When they come to commit this offense, there are routes that they escape through. At this time around, we say, OK, we, have, we know what we're going to do for them. We are not going to give them access road to us again. There are several entry and exit into some of these, our major cities and towns. So in our security meeting, State Security Council meeting, we decided to ensure that these various routes be rendered impossible for them. And that we did. And that incidence of killing reduced to its barest minimum. We have the intelligence. We have the information when and how they will come. And we decided to prevent them. And that's exactly what happened. Campaigns were run smoothly in Kogi State. Nobody was hindered. Every political party you know, participated in that campaign. So Nobody were, stopped anyone. So there was a somewhat a destruction of the, of the infrastructure of the state on the, on the altar of it security. Is, it that, is, look, if I have to pull down a building to secure lives and livelihood, I will do that. If I have to cut off a road to protect lives and livelihoods for a moment and fix it back, I will do that. Have you heard what Natasha is saying? He's, I, he's, he's pointing a kiss and finger at you. And I probably will love, for the sake of equity, for you to actually listen to a few of things that she said. Before, maybe, before, before, maybe, before maybe that. you can respond to it. Before because she's, she said, you are the one behind it. And you said, I mean, she said she has her fears about the reason why you are doing it. Do you want to listen to it? So you respond. Just for a moment. Let's listen to Natasha Aputi here. Nine polling units did not have their elections on the 25th of February. Materials were not delivered, and INEC offices did not present themselves. At that point, I knew that the governor had targeted that Ganaja as an axis to rig, just in case his Okene, Okene plan failed. All right, the nine, elect, nine polling units were slated for elections two days ago, which is the 26th, a day after the general elections. We deployed uh, security to ensure that there was no violence, and the people came out in their numbers. I'm even told that churches had to close early so the people can go out and vote, because it was a Sunday. The elections finished around uh, 2 a.m. that day, that's the next day, yesterday. And I tell you this, I, Natasha Akbutiudwa, won all of the nine polling units with great numbers. It would interest the good people of Nigeria to know that the majority of these nine polling units were outrightly cancelled yesterday upon frivolous petitions by the APC. All right. Governor Bello, uh, one would be wondering what exactly is going on. She keeps mentioning your name as the one after her. Can you tell Nigerians tonight that you really do not have anything against her? Because when she <coughs> mentioned your name uh, in all of this. I don't know why my name is so sweet in her mouth that uh, she will continue to mention and mention my, and mention. You see, let me tell you, Nigerians and uh, she. Do you know, I never for once lose sleep over her mentioning my name, either rightly or wrongly. You know why? Because she knows exactly what is pain in her. And what would, what would that be? I don't know. And I don't have any... She was a in. member of your party before now. There are several other members of my party that have left. Could it be that she's a threat in, politically? 
in that your area. You are from the same senatorial district. Look, let me tell you. I have um, one of my elder advisory council member <clears throat> from my immediate local government <clears throat> who decamped weeks into the general election. <clears throat> His polling unit, he could not even score one. Who decamped to PDP, he could not even score one. That is that. You see, I am the leader of the party. I am the leader of the state. I am the chief executive officer of the state. Natasha is one of my subjects. I am duty bound to protect each and every one of them. And uh, let me tell you, except today, I will never sit down and open to any clip of hers and listen. Have you seen the clip online about uh, one of the chairmen being caught tearing uh, allegedly? Have, well, you, have you seen well, that? One of my you know, security aides you know, brought it to my attention. And I think the security agencies are handling that. They will determine the veracity of that particular one. So I will not go into that. So, please, I think Nigerians should simply ask Natasha what does she really want? That every now and then, today she's contesting for this position, whether I'm contesting it or not, right. she'll be mentioning me. Tomorrow she's contesting for another, whether I'm there or not, she'll be mentioning me. Please ask her, what does she want? All right, Governor Yayabelo, we are totally out of time. Well, I mean, you are a governor of Kogi State. It would be unfair for me, on the behalf of the people of your state, not to ask you. I mean, you not, you're not running for governor again. In the next few months, there will be a governorship election in your state. Mm. But if there is one thing you think the people of Kogi State will remember you for as a legacy, what do you think that would be? Unity. Securing the life of our people and ensuring that the resources of the people work for them entirely. And you think you have utilized the resources to the utmost uh, uh, of your ability for the good of the people of Kogi State? To the best of my ability, all our financials are out there, online, and it has been certified to be among the best as far as the 36 states and FCT is concerned in Nigeria by World Bank and several other rating bodies. And the infrastructure is there. Let me tell you, when Mr. President came, Mr. President, when he came to, to commission our project, he asked me and turned to me and said, where did you get all this money from that you utilize in putting all these infrastructures together? And that is to tell you how much we utilize the resources, the mega resources of our people huh. for them. Governor Yaya Bello, Governor of Kogi, thank you so much indeed. It's a pleasure having you tonight on the program. Thank you.